Hi, welcome to the L Rush Show, where I deliver content intended to inspire, educate, and motivate. Engage with me online at lrush.com and on social media. Enjoy the show. Hey, everyone. Today, I'm going to do a solo episode, and I'm going to be talking about skepticism. You might have already heard me talk a little bit about it in the past or in some posts, but I'm going to get into it a little bit deeper today. And I think it's very interesting. It's a very interesting topic because it really challenges what we believe and then what evidence do we need personally to believe something or not believe something. I will be talking about healthy skepticism, our beliefs, how this factors into our motivation or lack of motivation to achieve our dreams and how this is connected to confidence. The reason I chose this topic uh, is based on the fact that one of my really good friends is a very serious skeptic, doesn't believe in anything, a uh, complete atheist, unless there's scientific evidence absolutely for it, won't believe it. And side note on this, it's always interesting, though, that skeptics do make choices based on things they don't need evidence for or that there's faulty evidence for. Most of the time, they want to see scientific evidence. There's varying degrees of beliefs and what evidence you may or may not need for anything. But with my friend, he's pretty much a hardcore skeptic and he follows all of the professional skeptics. And there's a very famous professional skeptic named Dr. Michael Shermer, very well respected. He's actually the founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine. He has been writing for Scientific American for 18 years. He's written books titled, you know, like Why People Believe Weird Things. He's always looking for scientific evidence behind people's beliefs. So I'm having a discussion with my friend and we're talking about a self-proclaimed psychic medium on television named Tyler Henry. He has a Netflix show. If you don't know who Tyler Henry is, here's the rundown. He's 26 years old now. Uh, he claims to be a psychic medium. And his story is that when he was around 10 years old, I think he started to see, talk to dead people, get messages, and would just sort of like tell people on the street or in his small town of California like at a coffee shop, like, hey, your grandmother has a message for you kind of thing. And they were accurate and crazy and people freaked out and thus bore his celebrity with being a psychic medium. All right, you can go and watch that Netflix show for yourself, research Tyler Henry, but we're talking about Tyler Henry. My friend thinks that Tyler Henry and anybody in the world claiming to be a psychic medium is literally bullshitting everyone. So they believe it's not just that maybe Tyler Henry may not have the ability, it's that nobody has the ability to connect with the dead. This is the claim of my skeptic friend and most skeptics, right? There's no evidence it's all bullshit. It's hokery. These psychic mediums get the thing right 50% of the time on whether your dead relative was a male or female, like, oh, through language and <clears throat> signals they pick up on. They, right. So to my friend and most skeptics, being a psychic medium in and of itself is not possible and it's bullshit. And anyone who's doing it is just a con man. Okay. That's their, their position. So <laughs> which is fine. A lot of it is bullshit. There are a lot of charlatans, of course. I'm not saying I believe in anyone who comes to me as being a psychic. Oftentimes, people only believe someone's psychic if they've had a personal experience of that, right? Um, like if I just came on the next show and I was like, hey guys, I'm suddenly a psychic. Uh, would you believe me right away just because I said it? You might. You might go, well, you know, I've known Elle for a while and she wouldn't say some crazy crazy shit like that, unless like it were true. So let me take a look further. But you also might be like, uh, yeah, not buying it. I want to see the proof. What would your proof be, right? It might be, tell me something I don't know. Give me a premonition. Talk to, yeah, tell me what my grandmother has to say. She's dead. Give me a message, y'all. Let me see, right? Okay. So obviously there are a lot of charlatans. There might be people that you believe or I believe have this ability. It doesn't matter because we're going along and we're talking about this professional skeptic, right? And this professional skeptic, my friend is telling me, went back in the 90s and did all these studies and statistical analysis on people that claim to be psychic mediums and found all this bullshit. And he sort of laid, <clears throat> this, um, this professional skeptic sort of laid out all of the evidence. And if you looked at it and you go look at Dr. Michael Shermer's work on James Von Pra, the medium, and like John Edwards or whatever, yeah, yeah, you would look at it and go, yeah, it looks like it's kind of shady, right? So this guy, Michael Shermer, is the biggest skeptic about psychics in the world 
has spent his life publishing articles, doing studies, following these people, interviewing them. That's how much he is invested in disproving their claims. Okay. It's all malarkey. There's no such thing as ghosts. You're dead. You're dead. Right. No communication is possible. Bullshit. Don't believe it. No afterlife. Nothing. All right. Fine. So we'll just accept that for a second. <clears throat> so then something really funny happened. After I'm talking with my friend about this, I'm like, all right, I'm going to go look up this Dr. Michael Shermer and see what he has to say. I want to look at his studies on, you know, psychic mediums and see the kind of stuff he's dispelling. I'd love to see what he has to say about some of the things I believe. Like, I'm just curious, right? So I go look him up and I'm doing research on him and I find a fascinating article. Okay. This professional skeptic wrote an article in about 2014 where he had an experience that shook his skepticism on this subject to the core. In fact, that's part of the title of the article. And so I find this to be very, very interesting. Here's a guy that literally does not believe that anything, anybody can talk to the dead. It's all bullshit. No energy after dead, not possible. Total scam. All right. So he's about to get married and his fiance is German and she's also a skeptic. Not surprising. And they had some things uh, of her sent over from Germany, you know, because she's moving now to the States, right? They're going to get married. So they moved some stuff over and apparently she grew up where her grandfather was basically her father and she loved her grandfather, but he died when she was 16. And I guess she was having some sadness this wedding week, sort of expressing to her husband, the professional skeptic that she you knows she really wishes that he could have been there with her on this momentous day. You know, he's not going to be able to give her away at the wedding. And, you know, she really wishes he could be there to see this moment and all this kind of stuff. All right. So as they're going through their things uh, from Germany, she finds a radio of her grandfather's that he used to play music on or whatever all the time. And so it was this cool old radio and her and her skeptic husband are trying to figure out how to get it to work. And, you know, he's tinkering around with it. He goes and gets new batteries. He's getting new like switches. He's doing all of the things to try to like tinker this thing back to life and nothing works. It's absolutely dead. So they dismantle it, take out the batteries, the whole thing. And um, they're like, all right, well, we'll just, this will just keep it around. And at, at the time they just sort of had it in a drawer. So then comes their wedding day and she and he start to hear sounds coming out of the radio, talk voices coming out of the radio. That's like upstairs in the drawer. And they go up, they look, and they're in disbelief. They're in disbelief. And in that moment, she looks at him and she says, oh my God, he's here with us. And Dr. Michael Shermer, the professional skeptic is like, what the fuck? And he describes it as this. He says, if you, if anyone told me that this happened, I would not believe them. I would give them all of my classic skeptical stuff. Law of averages, coincidence, might've been an electrical anomaly. Maybe you didn't realize you didn't, da, da, but da, da. he said, I would never believe this. I just wouldn't believe it. He goes, and yet I cannot explain this. I cannot explain this. And furthermore, he said, the feeling was so wonderful. The feeling in the moment that they believed this, they had this overwhelming feeling and how wonderful that feeling was and him basically saying he can't discount the personal experience because he has no evidence to prove that that radio started to make noise. And so I find that very, by the way, I went back to my friend, I go, hey, you forgot to tell me about the article with the skeptic you claimed where you're trying to prove skepticism about psychic mediums actually now says he can't even fucking prove it. He goes, oh, you found that article? Yeah, it's funny you didn't mention that to me. <laughs> we had a laugh about that. I'm like, you kind of, wanted to biased into that, right? You didn't almost maybe want me to find that article because now even your skeptic guy is not so sure. By the way, this is not an argument for psychic mediums or me telling you that you should believe in it. It's just an interesting story about skepticism, a professional skeptic, a decades long skeptic, the skeptic of all skeptics, who's even been skeptical about a topic that he suddenly now is not so sure what the hell happened. So anyone, It's, it's really interesting. He never believed it was possible. And then he has this moment and I'm really glad it happened. And also I want to say this about Dr. Michael Shermer. I'm very impressed that he actually wrote an article about it. He is a professional skeptic who have ripped on this shit forever. And he fell on his sword to come out and say, I had an experience that's weird that I would think was bullshit and I can't explain it. And it shook my skepticism to the core. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Let's say a psychic came out tomorrow on CNN, ABC, and was like, I'm going to predict everything that's going to happen in the next month. And let's say they did. I mean, look, even if maybe 95% of us believed it, we're like, oh my God, how'd they do that? There'd still be so many people who'd be like, nope, conspiracy. They knew evidence beforehand. Someone, da da, they made these things. 
there'd still be people that wouldn't believe, right? People stand in the face of scientific evidence and still defy it. And even if we all believed it, even if 100% of the people believe this psychic that comes out tomorrow and predicts everything and they're right, we still can't prove that. There's no scientific mechanism by which we can prove that someone can predict an event. We can't prove psychic abilities, right? They're in the experience. There's no double blind study, you know, that you can do to prove this. There's no brain waves we can watch to prove it. I mean, people have tried to, they've said, oh, you know, we monitor the brain of a psychic and then this area lights up more, but we don't know if just because that area lights up more, I mean, that's still not direct evidence. What I like about this example with Dr. Michael Shermer sort of falling on his sword and mentioning that his skepticism was shaking to the core on the subject of afterlife communication of some kind. It's very much like a really wonderful movie that if you haven't seen, you should called Contact with Jodie Foster and Matthew McConaughey. And it's a great exploration of this concept because Jodie Foster plays a hardcore scientist in the film who's an atheist and Matthew McConaughey plays a religious person. And she thinks he's kind of ridiculous for having a belief in this God and all these stories. And she thinks it's all made up. And she thinks it's ridiculous to have faith in God without scientific proof or evidence. She's very much that same science skeptic in the film, except for towards the end of the movie, she has an experience that defies science and that she cannot explain other than her knowing of it, other than her full experience of it, other than what's true for her to her core she cannot explain it with science, words, proof, nothing. And it's in this moment that she can't explain this beautiful experience she's had. And it's like, just like the guy, Matthew McConaughey, she ripped on previously at the beginning of the film, who can't explain his faith and his personal experience of his non-scientifically provable belief in God, right? It's really, really interesting. It's a wonderful movie. And it really does go to what Dr. Michael Shermer had said at the end of that article, which is like, I can't, not only was the feeling wonderful, I, I don't have anything else to say other than there was a knowing there that I can't prove. So if there's no scientific evidence, should it be just discounted and ignored? What about experience, right? So let me give one example, which would be me as a thyroid expert with my thyroid stuff and the book that I wrote, the book that I wrote and the way that I personally dose thyroid hormones and the way lots of people do, but the majority of the world is doing it a different way. And the majority of the world has actual quote unquote scientific evidence or studies done on their treatment that would lend itself to saying they're right. There are no studies in my category. And furthermore, I wouldn't be able to do one. If I went to Stanford or some big university where the people that make the other thyroid hormone are giving gajillions of dollars a year for research, and I come in and I'm like, oh, I got some money. I want to do a research thing here, but I'm going to do a research to say that they're not right in saying that they're the only answer. There's another answer. They would discontinue giving money to that school. Now, I'm not talking about conspiracy theories and shit. I'm talking about just legit political bullshit that goes on in this world. The government food pyramid is a diabetes making diet. We have diabetes problem. I'm not saying they're trying to give people diabetes. I'm saying it's the grain lobbyists, right? It's people with special interests. It's shoddy science to like, look back in the day, this guy Ansel Keys, he wrote a whole thing that said saturated fat gives you heart disease and everyone bought into it. Then we later find out, not me, just everyone later finds out he cherry picked that entire study just to go along with what he wanted the conclusion to be. If I told you right now that 98% of the people in California think I'm fucking awesome, and then I give you the details of my poll, and I only interviewed 10 people and they were all related to me, I mean, that would change your opinion about 98% of Californians. You'd be like, I fucking, you sampled five of them and they all know you and love you. So we got to look deeper because a lot of the scientific evidence out there for lots of things is fucked up. And then also there's things there's no evidence for. So let me talk about that for a minute. There is... I guess also just briefly, the most interesting person is the person who is devoutly religious and a hardcore scientist, <laughs> right? They're able to go, well, I just believe it for me over here and I don't need the scientific evidence for this belief. This belief feels good, but I do need it over here for some other things, right? And I would ask yourself, what kind of evidence do you need to believe in something different or not? Like, do you require evidence? For example, back to the thyroid thing briefly, I have a friend who's a nurse 
And we were talking about something else unrelated to thyroid. And she goes, well, I'm going to need to see studies on that medication because I need studies. I'm a studies person. I need evidence. And I said, that's interesting because you take thyroid hormone every day in a way where there's zero evidence. And in fact, all the evidence is out there would say you're crazy. So how do you, how do you get flat with that? And she's like, oh, well, because you had a personal experience, because you took a risk, because even though the science and the studies weren't there, you were suffering, right? You weren't getting better. You heard me, you heard other people who seemed reasonable say, you should try this. You did. And it worked. So you only have your experience to say, I know, and my labs look good and my vitals are great. Therefore, this is the right treatment. When 98% of endocrinologists in the world would be like, no, you shouldn't do that. And they're wrong, by the way, but that's just their uninformed opinion. So it's very interesting, right? And once I'm a science person, I need evidence. Oh, but in this one area, I didn't. I took a bunch of pills of a bunch of hormones where there's no scientific evidence for. I mean, there's enough science out there to make the conclusion, but there's no study. There's no double blind study on it. Just like she was saying she needed for this other point. So it's just interesting to look at that. I'm not saying she's even incongruent, but it is interesting to look at where you might be incongruent there. So, you know, Yes, there's no scientific proof of the typical biblical God, right? In fact, back in ancient Greece, they believed in many gods, all right? So technically, like technically, is there scientific evidence for any gods? No, there isn't. Are there a million documentaries where people are claiming that there is scientific evidence? Yeah, that's no different than anything else, right? Someone could go out and be like, I have scientific evidence that, uh, you know, this is happening. And you're like, well, whatever. I mean, let's, what's your evidence? But does that mean it's stupid to believe, like if the belief is not hurting anyone and it's making your life better and it's enriching your life, then who the fuck gives a shit whether there's scientific evidence behind it? All the skeptics are absolutely all over people like Joe Dispenza, Lynn McTaggart, claiming they're absolute hoaxy, crocky pieces of shit, trying to connect quantum science to consciousness saying you can't do that. All the skeptics call them quacks. But then look at the hundreds and thousands of people whose lives have been improved, including mine from knowing I've interviewed Lynn McTaggart and I love Joe Dispenza. Do I agree with everything they say about everything in life? No, not necessarily, but I love the way that they look at the world in terms of how we can create our own reality. And I've been following them for so much longer than they've been popular. I've really been fans. doesn't mean I'm a fan of everything they say about the world, but they do connect quantum mechanics and quantum physics with consciousness in a way that makes sense for me and always has. Does it matter that it's a mismatch? Does it matter that there's no proof? Do I believe their testimonials? Yes. Does it take 10 testimonials? Do I have to look outside of that? I'm the testimonial, right? Sometimes you are the only testimonial. So if stuff's working, but doesn't have scientific proof, does that make it? No, not if it's harmless. And so even if you don't believe in psychic, psychic medium abilities, right? But like, how do you feel after you watch Tyler Henry's show? Do you feel better about life? Do you feel hope? If, if he's telling a person that their dead one, dead loved one as a uh, loves them and wants them to be free. Uh, And let's say it's all a crock of shit, but that person leaves finally with relief for the first time in two decades after crying and being depressed because now they can let go. Then who the fuck cares if it's fake? Now, someone would say, because that's pulling with people, that's tricking people. Okay, sure. All right. And I I understand that point too. Let's talk about a classic uh, sort of skeptic-y type of belief thing with scientific evidence, which is a classic thought experiment. And it's kind of overdone, but I I do still like it because it has some gems in there, which is the sun is going to rise tomorrow, but we actually, we actually, the, the, the probability of the sun failing to rise tomorrow, it's not zero. It's not zero. We're not 100%, but we're not worried about it. Right. We sort of take our common sense based on celestial mechanics and based on, well, it's risen every day beforehand. Doesn't look like there's a meteor about to hit it, to destroy it, or right? Since the dawn of time, we can remember it's risen every day. We don't see anything in telescopes where it looks like something bad's going to happen to it. So no one makes plans with the caveat of like, well, meet you for coffee and route. But of course, you know, I mean, if the world's around, the sun rises. We assume it's going to rise, but we actually don't know for sure. But we're using our common sense and some probabilities in there. But again, from a scientific standpoint, it can't really be guaranteed. And nothing in life can be. It's full of risk. Even if you stayed in bed all day long, every day for your whole life to try to avoid risk, you're still going to get screwed because your muscles are going to atrophy. You're going to get bed sweat, right? Lack of sun, exercise. There are going to be all sorts of things you're going to get screwed with, even in your 
choice to try to avoid risk. There are consequences to everything. Hundreds of thousands of people what die every year on the roads in car accidents, but um, you get into your car every day and so do I. So every living moment is accompanied by risk. And sometimes our analysis is going to indicate that risk and or that a risk far outweighs the benefit that you could get from it. We're doing this constantly. We are always doing risk to benefit ratios. We do it with vaccines. We do it with medications, right? Like all this medication might cure my cancer, but it also has a 50% chance of killing me. All right. Well, well, that's a decision. That's a rough one. That's some rough statistics. Um, But there are choices we make based on risk to ratio benefits. So are you congruent with your beliefs in the world about evidence? Do you absolutely demand evidence everywhere for something, but then not in a lot of other areas where other people might require it? Do you leave, do you need that same level of evidence for one belief as you do for another? And if not, why? And what is it about the one belief that you need evidence for and the other that you don't? We live in a mostly unknown universe, right? Okay. So what do I mean by this? There are so many things scientists, physicists, astronomers have figured out, and it's fascinating. The conclusions they have come to about our universe are absolutely amazing, right? They've been able to use incredible supercomputers to even map out exactly visually what the earliest universe look like, looks like before the formation of our galaxies. Like it's absolutely astounding. And without math and the advance of math over time, this wouldn't even be possible. These discoveries would never be achieved. Okay. So one thing that's a huge consensus in the scientific community among, you know, cosmologists, astronomers, et cetera, is that we have something called dark matter. We cannot see it, but it makes up three quarters of all the matter in the universe. And according to science, it has really become the prevailing theory that then explains other bigger mysteries, okay? But there's still no evidence of it. There's no scientific method. There's no evidence of dark matter, but this stuff is the stuff that's holding it together and seemingly real fucking critical. It's not seeable, not measurable, The only way it's kind of measurable is sort of in its absence, the void, the distance, the black stuff, the space between. So we live in this world where we need like, oh, I need faith and science and evidence. But then there's so much about the world that's unknown and we're still okay. And we still live our life because we're not worried about this risk of the sun not rising tomorrow. So I would just say if you're a skeptic in the downer skeptic way where you're sort of downer on everything, it's going to lead to more negative attitudes in life. And the serious skeptics that I know are often contrarians and snarky downers. They're the ones always out there rolling their eyes. I know I used to be a skeptic. I used to be skeptic about half the stuff that I'm even talking about completely. The only thing that changed for me, and again, maybe this is my sort of close to a personal experience at first was I have a friend who's a scientist, very smart. I, and they're an atheist. Like they're absolutely have no, they're, they're one of those science people. I need evidence. And they had some experiences with learning and practicing the power of intention that were so amazing. I knew they were not bullshitting me. And again, this is down to my personal personal experience of trusting a friend's saying something to me. But you could have a stranger on the seat on the street telling me the same thing. And I'd be like, I don't know you. You can be bullshitting me, but not this friend. I thought my friend wouldn't be telling me this if he didn't really experience it. He's not crazy. And so let me try it. And I did. And it was really the most, it's been still the most profoundly amazing thing I've ever endeavored in my life. I just can't even deny it. My life has been exponentially better since I adopted beliefs that are not necessarily based in science really, or that there might be science, you know, convincing for me and you, but technically the stuff that I do believe in some of which could be called by skeptics a pseudoscience. But again, I'm not trying to give studies and prove it that way. I can't prove my coaching, right? But then you could talk to hundreds of people who are like, thank God she changed my life. She helped me, uh, whether it's she helped me become more confident or she helped me with my thyroid problem or she helped me finish a book, whatever. But I can't prove it. I can't do a study that proved that anything that I said or did or any time spent with you actually helped and equaled the outcome. Could you say it? You'd be like, there's no way I would have ever in this book without a, sure. But then someone could be like, how do you know? How do you know you could do it on your own? And you would have to say, like, the sun rises. You'd have to go, well, I can't technically say that I wouldn't have done it, but I can kind of say probably because of L or right. But there's no way for me to prove coaching. Yet people call me, right? People want me as their coach, but I don't offer any scientific studies on my website about, you know, the percentage of chances of them 
succeeding in any area based on my coaching. I just don't have evidence and you could never even find it if you want. It would be like finding evidence for a psychic to, and again, maybe technology or scientific method technology will be so much more advanced down the road that maybe they will have some measurement by which they can tell whether someone's psychic or not. But like for right now, we have no idea. And for right now, we can't measure whether or not someone's coaching did anything, right? The other thing that's really interesting about skeptics is uh, (laughs) they always reason their defeat before they get started. And that's why they don't pursue their goals and dreams. And that's why they're a downer on you. But here's the interesting part of this. So the way that they reason their defeat ahead of time is they usually quote a statistic or something that they think is one, like, well, five, what, 5% of musicians actually make a living at it? Or, well, I don't know. I heard that 70% of new businesses fail in the first year. I'm not going to be an entrepreneur, right? Whatever the quoted statistic is, right? They like to use a statistic or science or something like it, right? Or most people who pursue it don't succeed, whatever the thing is, right? But here's what's interesting. The skeptics, whatever quote statistic kind of signs they're using to say you shouldn't do it, I shouldn't do it, to reason their defeat, they always put themselves on the losing fucking side of whatever statistic number that is. Why would you do that? Why would you, if the number is uh, only 20% of people who pursue professional musicianry succeed, why would you throw yourself into the 80% that fail? Why would you throw yourself into the 20%? So you know what that gets you? That gets you 0% of fucking nothing because you never did a goddamn thing or tried, right? Because you were like, well, there's the statistic. I'm definitely going to be in losing category. And I don't like the 20% either. That doesn't look good. Doesn't seem probable. Therefore, I'm not even going to try it and do it. So before even trying to even attempt to see if it's possible, they just say probably not going to happen based on a statistic. And based on I'm throwing myself in the category of the losing side. So if you're a skeptic or you're this kind of person, or you've had moments like this, then, you know, is that you, do you not think you deserve it? Do you not think it's available for you? Do you think other people are just luckier? Even if it's possible for other people and you go, well, that's nice. Are you coming up with some excuse? Well, oh, well, they had this, or well, they had that, or they probably didn't have that. And I had that. So you know what is like ancestral as fuck is, is really giving it a positive attitude. The onward, upward failure is only feedback type of attitude. The go for it anyway. Fuck it, why not? In the process of doing it, I may learn something. I may find another thing. It may send me somewhere that I actually want to be even maybe this is not there. It doesn't matter, but you really are going to be more on the forward, onward, and upward as you release some unhealthy skepticism And even if you do have strong skepticism, if an endeavor won't hurt you like mindset or trying to do something with intention and it's not hurting anybody, it's just like you yourself trying it out, who cares? So you try to try it, give it a go. No one knows. No one's looking at you. There's no embarrassment, right? Uh, In the world of skepticism, another great book is Anita Morjani's Dying to Be Me. She's one of the most famous near-death experiences out there. Uh, She's a New York Times bestselling author and a global, just global bestseller. She has the most documented, medically documented proof of her near-death experience, not of her experience 30 hours in the coma in the hospital, but here's what happened to her in brief. She had cancer and tumors all over her body. She was at stage four lymphoma. She went into a coma in the hospital. They're like, she's going to die. Call everybody to come in and say their last goodbye. She's out of here. So she went into this 30 hour coma. She came out and when she woke up, she said, I don't have cancer anymore. And they're like, yeah, that's interesting. Um, You just got out of a coma. So you're probably delirious. You have cancer. She said, no, I do not have cancer. Check my body. They check her body a little bit. They didn't find it. They go, well, this is impossible. We're going to have to keep looking because cancer just doesn't disappear. She goes, you can keep searching all you want. I don't have it. She went into that coma and she knew when she was going to wake up, she was going to be cancer free. And her experience of what happened in that 30 hours of her being in the coma. um, And it's not religious, by the way. So some people are like, oh, is is she trying to prove God if you're like an atheist? It's not about that. It has nothing to do with that. I'm not a religious person. I'm very spiritual. Um, it's fascinating. That book is really incredible and will give you a lot about a lot of hope about your life. So even in a world where she has evidence, she's a best-selling author. I'm sure the publishers were like, we're not going to publish this unless we can see medical documented. We talked to doctors, blah, blah, blah. There's still going to be people out there who don't believe it. 
Or there still be people that will go, okay, fine. Well, that's a medical anomaly. She suddenly had a spontaneous healing event, but this whole business about whatever she had to say about what she learned in that 30 hours of her coma, that's bullshit. All right. Well, I don't know, man. When someone wakes up and says, I don't have cancer after stage four and tumor ridden body, and then they find out you're right. I might want to hear what the fuck they have to say. I want to hear what this person has to say. (laughs) You know what I mean? The philosophy behind acupuncture, which is over 3000 years old, there's no scientific proof, but there are amazing studies on how much it helps people with pain and other things. There's been studies on how it increases the chances of getting pregnant along with IVF therapy up to like 40%, I think. It's a huge number. That's an Israeli study that was done in the 90s or sorry, the 2000s. Um, placebo studies, skeptics hate those. Studies where everyone has a migraine, they give half the group the actual pill that's going to help or could help, and they give the other half the people a sugar pill telling them that it's the stuff that's going to help. And the Placebo group has great results. The placebo studies are fascinating. They say a lot. And that's a tough one for skeptics. How? Because they're saying there's no such thing as mind affecting body or mind affecting matter. They would call Dr. Bruce Lipton biology belief a quack too. But then you go, yeah, but someone's cancer disappeared or whatever. And they can chalk it up to coincidence or ever, whatever they want. It's just interesting. So I, I just love this topic. And I think it's interesting to evaluate your own beliefs and, you know, who are the skeptics in your life? Are you talking too much to skeptics? Do you need to stop sharing your dreams and goals with skeptics? Are you being held back in life because you're just kind of being skeptical about the probabilities of things you want to attempt? So a classic one would be, okay, you're going to die tomorrow. So tell me right now in this moment, what do you regret not trying? Everyone listening has a list here. It could be, oh, well, I never got to Greece. Could be that. It could be, oh, I wish I started that book. I never told that person I love them. I wish I came out as gay. I don't care. It doesn't matter what it is, right? You're going to have some regret right now if I tell you right now you're dying tomorrow and I ask you what the regret is. But then my second question would be, okay, uh, why haven't you done or pursued any of these things yet? Now, most of the time, the answer has nothing to do with, well, I didn't have the time. It's never about that. It's it, in my, my personal experience, when I've asked this question and go through this with people, it's, it's always about really related. If you dig deep related to how other people thought about it, my husband didn't approve. So-and-so would never let me, I was always told I was a terrible singer or whatever. It's always, or a statistic or whatever, but it is always something that has usually something to do with how you think you might be perceived in either the attempt of it or how you might be perceived in the potential failure after the attempt if you fail. The embarrassment, how people look, the I told you so, those kind of things. And a lot of you listening right now may be like, oh man, I know what you're talking about. Had that happen to me? Yep. We all have. We all have. So we've all done this. We've all, we all do it. I will say though, right now, pers- from a personal, there's so much, so many more things I want to do in life, but if I did die tomorrow, I'd feel fucking great about my life and the life I lived. You know why? I went for it. I went for it players. I'm still going for it. And the experiences and things that I had as a result of going for it, despite skepticism, despite looking at reality, have been so amazing and profound and enjoyable that I would never take it back. And if I died tomorrow, I'd be so fucking happy. But if you asked me this question 2005, I would say, no, I have a lot of regrets. There's a Finnish composer who has a quote, no one ever built a statue to a critic. My version is no one ever built a statue to a skeptic. We just don't admire and love and honor the people that don't think anything's fucking possible. We honor the people that think the impossible was possible, showed us that it was, had unwavering courage and faith and competence. So despite the skeptics, right? Despite them. The guy who thought wireless communication was possible, his friends brought him to a psychiatrist. They thought this motherfucker was crazy. He was like, look, I, we could talk to people through the air. And they were like, oh my God, this guy's going insane. Well, now we're doing it. Now I'm talking to you that way. So life exponentially changed for the better when I overcame skepticism, the unhealthy kind. I hope this has been enjoyable for you. If you guys like this podcast and haven't, I so would appreciate your writing a review on Apple Podcasts. It would really help. And thanks again for just for tuning in. I hope 
this work helps you, you can always reach out to me through my website. Any suggestions you have for solo topics, anything you want me to talk about. If you have any questions you'd like me to answer on a solo episode at some point, happy to do that. I hope you have a wonderful day and I hope you pursue your dreams and goals and go kick ass out there and take some names and, and stand back, put the hand up to skepticism for a bit. Hey listeners, you know, over the years, a ton of companies have approached me to collaborate, but I will only promote companies whose products I believe in and that I actually use and consume on a regular basis. So let me tell you about some of my favorite companies that I can offer you discounts for. Rep Provisions, an amazing company doing incredible things for our planet, topsoil, and animals with regenerative agriculture. And it's my number one source for quality pasture-raised meat and chicken. Visit repprovisions.com and use code L15 for 15% off. I'm also obsessed with a company called Carnivore Crisps. They make a lean, all-natural, and delicious alternative to conventional snacking made with just real meat and real salt totally addictive and my favorite ones are the beef brisket and the ribeye visit carnivorecrisps.com and use code paleo10 for 10 percent off i also love and regularly use paleo valley products they make amazing supplements and delicious paleo products i use the superfood greens powder grass-fed beef sticks the organ complex and their bone broth bars i love the lemon and apple i also use their essential c complex and more Visit paleovalley.com forward slash promos forward slash L Russ for 15% off. I also love Primal Kitchen. They make delicious paleo approved, gluten free, grain free, soy free, and no refined sugar products. And I use them daily from their collagen powders and sauces and marinades to their avocado and olive oil. So good, so healthy. Visit primalkitchen.com and use code L10 for 10% off. I also love paleo powder and use it almost on everything I cook. They make incredible seasoning blends and they also have these incredible grain-free coatings that feel just like crispy breadings that you would have had prior to knowing that there's another way. So visit paleopowder.com and use code L15 for 15% off.